mercy and the grace that you have for us, Father. We just thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you've uh, loved us enough, Father, just to be able to give us your word, Lord, to uh, tell us how much you love us, Father. And we just pray that you'd open our ears and our hearts tonight, Lord, to hear what you have to say to each one of us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would minister to us, Father, and that your word would come alive, Lord. We just ask that you'd... of Solomon's temple. They didn't have cameras. We really don't know what it looked like, but it kind of gives you an idea. That's the best as they can do from the description we have. But we find that description in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 4 says, And the vestibule that was in the front of the sanctuary was, sanctuary was 20 cubits long across the width of the house, and the height was 120. He overlaid the inside with pure gold. The larger room he paneled with cypress, which he overlaid with fine gold. And he carved palm trees and chain work on it. And he decorated the house with precious stones for beauty. And the gold was gold from Parvium. He also overlaid the house, the beams and the doorpost, its walls and its doors with gold. And he carved cherubim on its walls. And he made the most holy place. Its length was according to the width of the house, 20 cubits. And its width, 20, 20 cubits. And he overlaid it with 600 talents of fine gold. He continued, continues on in Second Chronicles, uh, verse four, chapter three, verse fourteen. He says, "And he made the veil. This is the veil of the temple, blue of blue, purple, crimson, and fine linen, and wove cherubim into it." And in verse fifteen, he says, "He also made in front of the temple two pillars, thirty-five cubits high." Now, a cubit is roughly the length of what from my elbow to my fin tip of my finger, foot and a half. So, thirty-five cubits high. If I do the math real quick, is roughly fifty. 50 feet high, and the capital, this is these two pillars, and the capital that was on top of each was five cubits, about seven feet high, just on the capital on top. And he made wreaths of chain work, as in the inner sanctuary, and he put them on top of the pillars. And he made 100 pomegranates and put them on the wreaths of the chain work. These pillars were so amazing that they actually named the two pillars. The one on the right-hand side, they named Joachim, and the one on the left-hand side, they named Boaz. It was an amazing building. It was built by the finest craftsman known to man at that time. It was, it was one of the wonders of the world. And these guys who remember how it used to be, a building worthy to reflect the glory, a building worthy to reflect the glory of God, now see some studs and rafters going up on a foundation that is surrounded by ruins. And in their minds, they know it will never be the same. In their minds, it's just a shadow of what was once the amazing temple of God. Guys, life can be discouraging sometimes. Sometimes we look back 
And we remember how things were, how wonderful they were, how things could have been or how they should have been if maybe we'd have just done things a little differently. But somewhere along the line, we let our guard down, and the enemy came in, knocked down a few walls, and we find our spiritual house is in need of serious repair. And as we look at the amount of damage that had been taking place in our life, the amount of damage that the enemy has done, we consider the work ahead and what it will take to repair the damage, and we realize that on our own there's no way that we can restore what has been destroyed back to its original state. Guys, and in our own strength, that's true. But God has a word of encouragement for these guys here in this chapter of Haggai, and for you and me also. He says in verse 4, he says, Yet, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, says son son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. There's three things here that God encourages them to do. The first one is to be strong, he says. It's easy to tell someone to be strong. Hey, suck it up. Suck it up. Be strong. But how do you become strong? How do you really become strong? The answer here is actually in verse 5. He said, according to the word of God and his promises. And we find that in the Bible. Isaiah 41.10 says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Real strength comes from the Lord. In fact, really the only true strength there is comes from God. Psalms 27.1, David said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Hebrew word for strong is shazak. And it means literally to fasten upon. And when you see that task ahead is overwhelming, bring God into the picture, fasten upon him, be strong. That's how you become strong in the Lord. You will succeed. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, the second thing God tells him to do is to work. Uh, the Hebrew word for work just means literally to do to accomplish, to do something. See, first you have to have the faith to grab hold of God and know that he will strengthen you, but you don't stop there. You need to do something. See, you can have all the faith in the world, but if you don't do that work that God has told you to do, if you don't step forward and do, your faith is of no benefit to you. James 2.20 says, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? See, you have to do, you have to step forward. And thirdly, you have to do it without fear, he says. That means to do it in faith. Now, I, I've heard the argument, and I'm sure that many of you have heard it also, that the opposite thing of faith is fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. So if you do it without fear, it means you do it in faith. I don't know if that's true or not. I know some say the opposite of a fear is love. But I do know this, fear and faith, they don't coexist. We see that when Jesus was in the boat during the storm, when it was getting real stormy and the apostles were becoming afraid. And they asked Jesus, Jesus had to calm the waves for them, but they were afraid and Jesus said to them in Mark 4.40, he says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? See, we do know that faith can eliminate fear, but what was interesting with these guys, these apostles, apostles, as soon as he calmed the waves, they feared him exceedingly. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny because he calmed the waves. But whether or not fear is the opposite of faith or love is, I do know that if you're strong in the Lord, if you have a firm hold on him, you won't have fear. Because 1 John 4, 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So we know that God is love. And 1 John 4, 18 says, For there is no fear in love, but perfect, fear, perfect love casts out fear. So to effectively build on the foundation that God has laid in your heart, draw close to him, obey his word, Step forward in faith. That's a recipe for success. Verse 6 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, 
and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. See, God continues to encourage them to keep on doing the work that he's called them to do by giving them a promise of what is to come, of what the end result of this temple will be. He's already told them that he will strengthen them and always be with them if they just follow and obey. And now he gives them a promise of what is to come concerning the temple. And even though it's going to be hard for them to imagine, God tells them that the temple that they are building on will be filled with glory. He says, for I will fill this temple with glory. And we know that that was fulfilled when Jesus Christ came down to earth and stood in the temple and spoke the word of God. He also tells them that the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. And in this place I will give peace. Now some expositors say that here God is referring to that the time of Christ when Herod had done an amazing makeover on the temple. And again, it was a magnificent structure. There's another photo here of what it could have possibly have looked like if we show it up. We don't know if that's what it looks like or not, but we do know that Herod went all out to try to make it look more amazing than even Solomon's temple. And we know that the glory was even greater than the former of Solomon's temple and that this prophecy was fulfilled when Christ, the king of peace, stood in that very temple. And while it's true that Herod's temple was amazing and that this prophecy could have been fulfilled, this prophecy is actually pointing to a time to come also. When Jesus returns again and he sets up his kingdom in the temple of Jerusalem to reign on this earth, and there's a couple of things that point to that. God says, I will shake heaven and earth and the sea and dry land and I will shake all nations. This refers to the end of time when Christ returns and the ungodly things of the world will be removed. The only place we see this verse here in Haggai in the New Testament being spoke of is in Hebrews where the author of Hebrews is speaking of Christ setting up the kingdom of God on earth. In Hebrews 12, 25, it says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for they did not escape him who refused him who spoke on earth. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. The second reason we know this prophecy points to the time when Christ returns is that Haggai tells us they shall come to the desire of all nations. The desire of all nations is Jesus Christ. And the world shall come to him, to the latter temple, to worship him. Since this hasn't happened yet, we know it's a futuristic futuristic prophecy. And Haggai also says that the glory of the latter temple would be greater than the former. And while Herod's temple temple may have been greater than Solomon's, the word latter here, akaron, in Hebrew literally means last. And the last temple in Jerusalem on this earth will be the one that Christ rules and reigns in during the millennial period. And God says that he will give that place peace. And that's never happened yet either. So we know it's a futuristic prophecy. See, these people working on the temple here had something amazing to look forward to. But you know, we talked last week about the temple that God's building in our lives, the foundation that God has laid in our lives. And as we build on the foundation in our own lives, to us, we could look at someone like, Billy Graham or Chuck Smith or whoever you want to single out or what God's done in their life. You might look back at your own life and think, as a temple of God, I look pretty pathetic. I look pretty pathetic. But instead of getting discouraged, grab hold of God. Grab hold of God, keep building, have faith in the outcome. Because God's made us a promise also. Because the end result will be in in our earthly temple here. Our temple, too, will be filled with the glory of God, and His glory will be revealed through us. It says in Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There will become a time when the glory of God will shine through each one of us. 
Verse 10 says, And on the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, The word of the Lord comes to Haggai. See, he said this uh, when he said the, <coughs> excuse me, Ask now the priest concerning the law. So this word of the Lord comes to Haggai again on December 18th, 520 B.C. It's roughly two months after his last prophecy we just read. They've been working on the temple now for about three months, and the building seems to be going well. The people seem to have turned back to God. They listened to the prophet Haggai, and they heeded the word of God. And they've turned back to building the house of God, and now Haggai has a message from God to the priests, the spiritual leaders of Jerusalem. He says in verse 12, he says, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priests answered and said, No. See, these priests were constantly considering and expounding on the law. They knew the ins and the outs. And God, through Haggai, he asked them a question concerning the law. See, the priests, they would partake of sin offerings after they had been sacrificed and offered up to God. And the law said that the meat was holy. And that the priest, that they were allowed to partake of this meat. In Leviticus 6.25, it says, Speak unto Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest that offered for sin shall eat it, and in the holy place shall it be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. So God asked them, and I'm going to paraphrase here, if you're carrying the holy meat, if you're carrying a ribeye roast in your garment, and it comes from the sacrifice, and it bumps into a loaf of bread, or some baked potatoes, or some oil, or some pork chops. No, I take that back. Lamb chops. Since the ribeye is considered holy, does it make whatever it touches holy? Easy question for these guys. No. No matter how you try, you can't. man can't impart holiness by touch. If the Pope blesses you, it doesn't make you holy. If you're anointed by a pastor or a group of pastors, it doesn't make you holy. If you take communion, it doesn't make you holy. Only God can make someone holy. So Haggai asked them another question. In verse 13, Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. See, they knew the law. Numbers 19.11 says, He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. Numbers 19.14 says, And this is the law when a man dies in a tent. All who come into the tent, see, you don't even have to touch the dead body. All who come into the tent and all who are in the tent shall be unclean seven days. Not only that, Numbers 19.22 says, Whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean. So if you go into the tent, uh-oh, there's a dead body, and you turn around and go, you're unclean. You go out and you touch a loaf of bread, that loaf of bread is unclean. So all the person touches shall be unclean. The person who touches it shall be unclean until evening. See, they knew the answer. It was easy for them. Whenever something or something touches something that is unclean, they become unclean. Pretty easy quiz for these guys. Verse 14 says, Haggai answered and said, Well, so is this people. And so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. See, God made it simple for them to understand. See, they thought they had aced the test. They thought they'd gotten all the answers right. But God was asking them simple questions, not to make it easy for them to pass a test, but to make it easy for them to understand that they had missed the boat. That instead of being holy, instead of being set apart to do the work of the Spirit, they were unclean. See, they had unclean things in their hearts, which made them unclean. They were God's chosen people who had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city, to rebuild the nation. But the fact that they were God's chosen people didn't make them holy. The fact that they were in the land that God had given them didn't make them holy. The fact that they had laid the foundation of the temple and had begun to work on it didn't make them holy. The problem was that their hearts were not focused upon God. 
but instead it was focused upon their own desires. And the fact that God's temple was lying in ruin, it showed that. See, what God wanted wasn't someone to play the part of being holy. He wanted someone, a holy people, to call his own. Someone to have a relationship with. And we think the same way a lot of times. Some people believe that because they go to a certain church, that they're okay. They're okay. Or that they're involved in a certain ministry. Or because God is using them in some area, that they're okay, that their walk with the Lord is fine. But many times, like these guys, even though our walk looks good from the outside, our hearts not turn to God, but to our own desires. See, He wants the same for us as He wants as it was for them. God wants us to be holy. And we say, well, why is that? Because He wants us to be someone He can call His own. And the only way that will happen is if we are holy. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But He who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Because as it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Hebrews 12.14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. See, in order to see God, you have to be holy. So what is holiness? The answer is very simple. It means to be set apart. Holiness to the Lord means set apart to be used for the Lord. So again, how do you become holy? And that's a very important question. Because you will not have eternal life with God if you're not holy. You won't see God if you're not holy. Paul tells us how to do that. In 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 17, chapter 6, verse 17, he says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. So you become holy by getting away that which is un- getting away from that which is unclean, by separating yourself to be used by God. Paul's saying the same thing that Haggai said. See, we become unclean because instead of grabbing a hold of God, we've grabbed hold of the things of the world which has defiled us. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Timothy 2, 21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself with the latter, which is speaking of iniquity there, cleanses himself from the latter, He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So how do we cleanse ourselves? How do we get rid of that sin, the uncleanness in our lives? And you guys all know the answer. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Very simple, guys. Turn to God. God, forgive me my sins. Grab hold of God. Seek the Lord. What would you have me do? Step forward. Have no fear. Verse 15 says, And now carefully consider this. This is Haggai still speaking to them. It says, And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephes, there were but ten. And when one came to a wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. He said, I struck you with blight and mildew, hell and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. See, last week we discussed that. God had given a curse upon his people. Their crops weren't producing like they should. Their animals weren't producing like they should. They never had enough. They had holes in their pockets, the Lord said in the first chapter. And Haggai's letting them know your relationship with God is never a God issue. What I mean by that is, it's always a heart issue. See, God will never turn away from someone if he's unprovoked. God always wants to be blessed. He wants them to be blessed and them to have a relationship with him. God's always there for you. God will allow crazy things to happen in your life to try and get your attention back to him. So the world doesn't swallow you up and bring eternal damnation upon yourself. But you know, matter, you know what? No matter what God does, no matter how drastic his actions may be, it won't have any effect if your heart stays focused on your own desires. We see it here where God cursed their crops, their animals, their land, their finances, yet they did not turn back to me, said God. 
And we still see it in the world today where things are going crazy. Crazy things are taking place. We live in a world full of sin where one disaster follows another, yet we don't turn back to God. And ultimately, at the end of times, when God is giving one last final chance for the people to avoid eternal damnation, we find in Revelation to get their attention that God causes great plagues to come upon the earth. Men develop terrible sores upon themselves. The ocean becomes blood and all the creatures of the sea die. The rivers and the water become blood. The sun becomes so hot that it scorches man. You would think that that would get their hearts to soften up and to consider God. But instead, it continues in Revelation 16, verse 9, And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. So God gives them even more. He said, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. You would think this would get them to turn back to God. But instead they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. It's interesting that even though God will allow things to happen in order to get our attention, what really draws us to have a relationship with him, it's when we realize the mercy and the grace, and the love that God has for us. Romans 2.4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? See, I think when man begins to realize just how much God really loves him, that's when man is encouraged to allow himself to be set apart, to become holy, in order to have a close relationship with God. And even though the plagues God sent upon these people may have gotten their attention, what turned them back to a relationship with God was that he sent a prophet. He sent Haggai to help them see that God wanted to have a relationship with them, that he wanted to dwell among them. Haggai gave them words from God to them. He said, hey, you guys are doing well. You're living in your nice paneled houses that I provided you, but I don't have a place here, God said. But I want to be here, God was telling. This is where I want my house to be with you in your midst. And they decided that they wanted that relationship and they turned back to building the temple so God could dwell among them. And as always the case, when you have a relationship with God, they were blessed. Verse 18 says, Consider from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. God tells them, I'm with you. The curse of sin has been removed. You will once again bear fruit. God will pour out his blessing upon them again. And I think it's cool that God just didn't pour out judgment upon us to show us the error of our ways, guys. If that had been the case, we probably would have just continued in our sinful ways. But I'm thankful that God sent us a messenger to show us how much he loved us. He sent his son to die upon a cross to pay for every sin we've ever committed. So just so we could have a relationship with him. So we can have eternal life with him. And I think that when man comes to the realization of what Christ did for us and the love that he has for us, that if, if that doesn't bring someone to repentance, to holiness, to be set apart, to have a relationship with the creator, creator of all things, I don't think anything will, guys. Haggai has one more message from God. And it comes on the same day in our calendar, December 18th, 520 B.C. And it's a personal message to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. Verse 20 says, And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and all who those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. And that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will make you Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Now God calls Zerubbabel his servant. And he tells Zerubbabel that he will shake heaven and earth and overthrow the Gentile kingdoms of the world, and that he's chosen Zerubbabel and is going to make him his signet ring. Now, in those times, a signet ring was something the king gave you. It was like having the signature of the king. It gave you the authority of the king. See, if you had the signet, king, signet ring of the king, you were the voice of the king. You were the will of the king. 
Whatever command you gave was the same as if the king had given it. Given it. And if someone took action against the person having a, the king's signet ring, you took action against the king himself. God's given Zerubbabel the authority, not of a king, but of himself, of God. And I thought, wow, that's pretty incredible. And after reading this, you might really expect a whole lot from Zerubbabel from this point. Except when you read the Bible, all you find out about Zerubbabel is that he led the captives back to Jerusalem, Jerusalem which we already knew. He laid, helped lay the foundation of the temple. And we know that in 515 B.C., roughly four or five years after this prophecy, the temple was rebuilt. And you do find in secular readings from that period, or documents from that period, uh, the finished temple was sometimes referred to as Zerubbabel's temple. But that's about it. Nothing more. There's no major war victories, no miraculous works, no amazing prophecies from Zerubbabel. So what's this all about? Now in Hebrew prose, many times people are referred to by someone, usually a famous person, in their lineage. For example, David was called the son of Jesse. Being David's dad, Jesse being his dad, that's not unusual for David to be called son of Jesse. But you also see Christ being referred to several times as the son of David. You remember the blind man in the New Testament? Son of David, son of David they called out. Now David's not Jesus' dad. But he is in, Jesus is in the line of David. David would be David's great, 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 however many great grandfather. But they also, in the Bible, they refer to Jesus as David. They called Jesus David. You see in Jeremiah 30, verse 9, it says, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. <clears throat> see, this couldn't be speaking of King David. He had been dead for over 300 years when this is written. Jeremiah is speaking of Jesus Christ and refers to him as David. That's what's taking place here. The question is, is who is represented by Zerubbabel here? When God's saying, you, I will give you my signet ring, and all these things are going to happen. See, there's a reason Zerubbabel was appointed governor of the people returning to Judah. He happened to be a descendant of the last legitimate king of Judah. King Jeconiah, Coniah, Jehoiachim. Depending on which side of the fence, all those were his name. See, if Judah was still a sovereign nation, most likely Zerubbabel would have been the king. He would have been in line to be king. But like Jesus, he too was in the line of David. But what makes it really interesting is Matthew 1, chapter 1, and Luke chapter 3 both give the lineage of Jesus Christ. Matthew follows the lineage from Abraham to Joseph which is Jesus' legal father. And Luke follows a lineage from Adam all the way to Mary, Jesus' biological mother. Both of those lines from, from Mary and Joseph, they pass through Abraham. Both lines pass through David. But it just so happens that Zerubbabel, the last descendant of a king in the lineage of Christ, that both of these lines pass through. And this was the last time that happened in that lineage, the last person that the, both of them passed through. See, this prophecy here in Haggai is an end times prophecy that points to Jesus Christ, who is the only one who has the authority to wear the signet ring of God. And again, as earlier in the chapter, it points to a time the Messiah will come and rule and reign on the earth, and all will be brought under the subjection of Jesus Christ. But guys, the question is this. We're building on a temple. God's called us to be holy. He's called us to be set aside to do His work. See, we look at the work we do in our lives, and sometimes we're very disappointed. But see, God can take that and do amazing things, because at the end, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. That's bizarre. That's bizarre. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. Again, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. I just pray, Lord, you'd bless every one of us here, Lord, that you would encourage us in our walk, Father. Encourage us, Lord, to truly to be set apart, to be used by you, Father, to put you in the center of everything that we do, Lord, to allow you to lead and direct and guide us, Father. I pray for a blessing upon us all, Father, and I thank you again. We ask it through your Son, Jesus. Amen.